Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all the viewers, uh, respected physicians. This is our 30th lecture uh, on behalf of ECG study group, which is the part of ECG basic and beyond. Today our topic is ECG in clinical, uh, will be ECG in clinical practice. And today the lecture will be provided by Professor, uh, respected, renowned Professor M. Muzir Islam sir, who is a former EGC uh, professor of cardiology in the BSMMU. My request, Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary sir, to say a few words about our uh, respected Professor Nazir Islam sir, and then we proceed. Wadu sir. Assalamu alaikum everybody and good evening. It's a pleasure meeting everyone again after quite a, a long hiatus. And I hope the pleasure will be shared by everyone. Uh, Professor Nozli Samsar, I'm a direct student of his. One of the key things about his is that if you go to our new market and uh, one of the key bookstore who sells medical textbook, he will say, you know, this is if the only two professors always bought the, the newest editions of every important cardiology books. One of them is Professor Nozli Samsar. And before he uttered his name, I said, I know who is going to buy those things. That will be our sir. And that is Professor Nazir Islam. He has always been uh, up to date in the knowledge. And whenever he gives a lecture, uh, that's a beauty because you will find both the erudite presentation of a very important topic which is very wide in concept and also very deep in the assessment of the whole thing. And today, we hope we are going to again find out how he presents the 12 British clinical concepts and the background. Professor Lothisam Sir has been director of our National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. He has been the UGC Professor of Cardiology in BSMMU, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib Medical University. He has been also the course coordinator and he has been one of the key person who is responsible for the creation of the this residency program uh, as a whole in BSMMU. I hope Sir will provide new insight, new concepts and a new thought process in the field of cardiology teaching, not only the subject, but also the teaching methods and other things. Dear audience, let us enjoy our dear Professor Nuduli Samsar's lecture. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Odud, for his compliment. Actually, I am I am not a physician of that high. Uh, however, I like everybody of you over here, and I think that uh, regarding this subject, uh, all of you you know and very up to date than me. Uh, however, I like to uh, introduce uh, before my uh, uh, de dedicated uh, presentation. I like to to do some of the cardiologic development in Bangladesh in a very short, in a, in a very extempore way uh, uh, during, the, uh, during the presentation of the ECG history. Uh, <clears throat> so actually, uh, before you st by, I start, I'd like to thank uh, the ECG study group for initiating this, uh, type of, uh, this type of program for the proper development of not only cardiologists, but the general physician who needs ECG uh, for, for their whole life. And uh, I, in this respect, I must thank uh, especially the two course director, Professor Wadud and Professor Athar Ali, and of course, uh, 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 another two, Dr. Rufiq, and uh, for their international advisors uh, for just contributing 
to the development of continuing knowledge, especially in the field of uh, ECG in our country. Now, if we look uh, uh, for my presentation, the basic is uh, basic objectives of today's educational uh, item is to basics of cardiac electrophysiology in a very simple way to understand by the residents, especially residents. And today's presentation is mainly focused for the residents, diploma students, and the fellows of cardiology under, in training. And then subsequently, I'll go for a fundamental principles of ECG in a very short. And what are the components of ECG waveforms and basic ECG measurements I have discussed in a short. And lastly, uh, what is the approach of trial bed ECG interpretation. Now, uh, in the timeline of clinically parting and landmarks of the ECG development, I can show this is, you can see that uh, in 18, actually 42, actually first there was recorded electrical activity was found in the heart of a frog. So that was the first electrical activity that was detected and presented at, at those scientific, scientific meeting of the scientist by Mata in 1842. In 1887, Weller actually first recorded the first electrical activity in the human heart, but quite a long time after, about 40 years later. In 1893, Eindhoven, every one of us know, he first uses the term uh, of this electrical activity of the heart as EKG or ECG. In 91, basically that is the turning point of the history of the ECG when Antovan built string galvanometer based on three lead EKG machine. That was the first EKG machine with three lead ECG machine. And after a long time from UK to US, this knowledge has gone up in 1908, EKG actually entered in the US. In 1924, Antoven had got the Nobel Prize for this for and at that time. And in 1934 to 38, actually, Wilson invented the first the central lead, the, the Wilson's uh, precordial leads. And 1948, augmented leads were uh, actually developed. And in 1944, from that now on, they presented a uh, 12 bed ECG, as you, you know it now. And, Actually, you can say that present the ECG has, has got the maturity in 1954. Now, if we go to the history to a slight extent, uh, this is the, some of the pictorial form uh, where Antoven started his first human recording there and subsequently different type of leads were invented. And this is the typical primary, the primary shape of the galvanometer electrocardiography uh, in, uh, in uh, actually basically it was done in the Cambridge. So that was the first, possibly that time, that was the smallest one uh, which uh, has developed for uh, echocardiography. And that actually initially, uh, it recorded three, three leads, then six leads, and afterward, there were 12 leads. Now, if one show in a slightly uh, formal way that uh, if you see the recording, the Antoven string galvanometer actually has recorded in the three steps. The first, it was done by a wallet. In the top, you can see the uh, ECG format in the single lead ECG. And later, Eindhoven actually uh, do, done it by capillary electrometer in the middle part here. And lately, uh, same Eindhoven has given by the string galvanometer, which looks most like the present ECG format. So this was the just transition from, uh, from Weller to Eindhoven and to the present strategy. So if you can see that, uh, the, this is started. This ECG actually started from the dog and animal in the room. And then it goes to the lab and used to by the human uh, subject for recording electrocardiography. And this was the first electrocardiography which was proposed and given in handwriting on the anthropy, you can see on the, on the tracing. Uh, later, this was the type of machine. It was uh, in the earlier part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the century, this type of machine was used. And then later, this was the mode mod of the machine. It was used in 1940s to 50s. And later, uh, this is the pre present day uh, ECG machine as you use, everybody of us used. So there is a long way to come uh, from the system to that. Not only that, here now, the ECG, ECG has gone from the room to the wrist. So this is the development of ECG, which is a fundamental position of electrocardiography. This is now the very fundamental, uh, fundamental medical tests and a parameter to judge, to follow, to monitor the patients of heart disease, not only heart disease, 
but for many other diseases. Now, let me tell something about uh, the beginning of cardiology in this, uh, this part of uh, Bangladesh. Actually, if you can start uh, uh, cardiology from uh, in, uh, here in this uh, part of Bangladesh, which was previously known as East Pakistan, the Hakka Medical College was the first place where the first uh, cardiology uh, uh, services, or the share of services, was started. And that was the, had been, had been credited to the Shahid Professor M. Fazle Rabbi, uh, which uh, actually has become Shahid in 1971. And he graduated from Dhaka Medical College in 1950, the year I born. And he obtained membership with cardiology in 1962. You know that in those, those days, uh, those days, even up to 70s, MRCP uh, was uh, is a general medical examination and training program, not like that, like today's one. In that, that case, uh, any, any candidate can take an extra sub-specialty subject. You can take a gastroenterology, a cardiology, etc. And Professor Rabbi taken cardiology as his uh, extra subject, and he become the, in addition of his MRCP, he got the cardiology training. And with this, he joined in 1963 and become the professor of medicine and cardiology in 1966, uh, 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 the year I passed the ACS examination. So, so and uh, another one important aspect to me is that his younger brother, Fadil Shahid, is my classmate, and we are born, uh, brought up from, uh, from class two to uh, 12 class in Rajshahi College. So, and that time, possibly, this type of machine was used in Dhaka Medical College. And if you, if you think that those who are graduated from Dhaka Medical College, you have seen a, a room uh, slightly upper level in the, uh, in the uh, near ward number one, and that was designated for, uh, designated for uh, cardiology ward. In fact, the professor of medicine who used to have do cardiology was, was uh, designated for that room. And he was one of them. And uh, it is also to be informed that he was the youngest of those days, MRCPs in the whole of this country, Pakistan, the whole of this Pakistan means Eastern West Pakistan. So it has been shown that he actually started doing uh, cardiology uh, within medic medicine ward, that he was in charge of it. At that same time, another professor of the same caliber was Professor Rob, who is now, an, uh, uh, who actually migrated to uh, Pakistan during liberation war. And both of them were equally known and equally intelligent, and they, they were many loved by the teachers of those, those days. Subsequently, basically, uh, in 1970, uh, 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 during the 1964, uh, most of the IPGMR was created, but uh, I, I'm going to very, very uh, short. Uh, IPGMR was created in, uh, in Dhaka Medical College in 1965. And subsequently, in 1966 and 1977, March, the cardiac center in Pakistan was done by Brigadier uh, Malik. And that was, a, that was the first cardiac center in the army sector in Pakistan. Lately, uh, lately uh, he was deputed to oh, Bangladesh, uh, that, that time East Pakistan, when IPJMR was housed in Dhaka Medical College in a teen state. And in that time, to develop cardiac services, along with other sub-specialists of the in the postgraduate medical institute, cardiovascular services was created. And that, that creation has got two components. One was cardiology, another was cardiovascular surgery. The first cardiology uh, professor was, was uh, Professor Brigadier Malik, but he was deported, he was on deportation from army to the civil services. And First cardiovascular surgeon in this country was Professor Ali Asraf Shah. And both of them was very meticulous of developing their subject and gradually they tried to develop it. And subsequently, when the, in, during the uh, liberation war, IPGMR was shifted to the, uh, to the Shahbag Hotel. Now, the, now this is BSMMU. In that case, here also, they have got a very small place to develop cardiac surgery and cardiac surgery. And th th those days, actually, the uh, CMC and other surgery was being done by Professor Ali Asra at that time. Uh, but in 1978, the NICBD project was taken by the government, and uh, ultimately, the NICBD developed in the state of Bangladesh. So I'm not, not, I'm not, not, uh, not going to uh, further detail. 
most of the later uh, history you must know the one important aspect i must say in this regard that in those days when the first machine of ecg was uh, ecg machine came to dhaka medical college by professor fazlur rabbi and that was also always kept inside lock and key in the almira because that was really at that time costly machine as very important machine everybody could not handle it and uh, when the is needs the professor with his uh, colleagues go to the patient and uh, have the ecg done and this procedure this process was uh, going for long long time and subsequently all the medical colleges after the medical college including rajshahi medical college uh, we have got all a single machine when i was in Uh, uh, assistant registrar in medicine for six months in ni- early 1977, late 76. That time also, when we need an ECG, we had to call the uh, cardiographer. Cardiographer means that was the one post in Dhaka Medical College, another in Rajshahi Medical College, another one in Ch- uh, Chittagong Medical College. The post name is still there is cardiographer who operate the echocardiography machine. So we had to call the call the cardiographer from his home, sending an ambulance, and then. Uh, Take an ECG, and we many of us, may, maybe three, four, five, six person, uh, try to resolve the matter, try to read the ECG. That was the history of ECG. So now, the, now this is the actually the you can say is the older history of ECG and development of cardiology in this country. So let us go for uh, the uh, presentation proper. Uh, let us say something about the ABCs of the cardiac electrophysiology. All, all of you know. first we have to consider that heart basically is an electrically driven and timed pump so this is an electrical driven and its all activity is timed up and serially the contraction and relaxation of cardiac muscle basically they are a specific synchronized pattern between atria and ventricle to maintain the circulation in the proper way the rhythmic contraction and relaxation proceed the electrical activity which we call actually uh, action potential the origin and sequence of the initiation and propagation of the action potential is essential to maintain the normal heart normal function of the heart in rhythmic contraction these currents are produced by the pacemaker cells specialized conduction tissue and many of the ventricular cells can produce in, in due course of time so this is the basic electrical uh, electrical aspect of the heart and if you can see in the figure in the left side you can see the uh, the conduction network in the heart is starting from the sino to we know different internal lines and different branches so these are the speed through which the impulse goes and these are the speed so look the sinusoid in, in generates the region but in atria it is the speed is slower but during the bundle by even node it takes a longer time the bundle branch but it takes a slightly longer time but when it goes within the contraction they have to minimum time so these are the tissues and these are the speeds at which this impulse formation node traverses through through the different uh, uh, part of the conduction system to the ventricular muscle and con- and they contract so these are the uh, ecg formula i will discuss in later so the basic aspect is we have got some impulse formation capabilities of the heart and we have got some trans- uh, transmissibility of the different type of tissues specialized tissues and contractile tissues and thereby heart can contract synchronously so then an effective circulation can develop in for the maintenance of life or maintenance of the circulation of the body so the basic uh, activity is usually done by the ionic ionic uh, uh, power of the body we call it membrane potential the cardiac cells like all other living cells have an electrical potential and this we call membrane potential the membrane potential depends on the maintenance of the ionic constituent gradient so you can see in the left hand side the by different type of ions channels etc i am not going to detail so by this different type of ion channels a membrane potential is being maintained even in during rest and during activities this has stimulated and given rise to the electrical impulses down to the ventricular muscles and giving to the to contraction so if you can uh, classify the membrane potential usually in the two part one is the resting membrane potential potential i'm going to just simple physiology of cardiovascular system in the in, in particular so the first type is the resting membrane potential we can say it as a resting as a resting state and uh, uh, scientifically it is because it polarized because this uh, uh, this membrane has got certain polarization so we call potential but this is in the resting state and this phase we can call it also the phase of readiness 
the muscle is relaxed at the and the cardiac cells are ready to receive an electrical impulse. So in this state, muscles are relaxed, but they can take any impulse uh, they get from outside or from implant. The second one is the action potential, which has got two parts actually. One is depolarization. We can call it this as a phase of contractions. The cardiac muscles have transmitted an electrical impulse, causing the cardiac muscle to contract. This is the sorry, initial part. And then the second part is relaxation. We can call it the recovery phase. The muscle has contracted and it goes back to its ready stage and it means the polarized state or the resting state. So if you remember, the membrane potential has got uh, mainly two phases. One is resting membrane phase, another is action potential phase. And the action potential phase has two parts. One is depolarization phase and the repolarization phase. And uh, if we See, for a cellular level, you can see over here in the side of the uh, of this brain, this is fully repolarized or the resting stage of this of, of the muscle. When it is being stimulated, there is one set of depolarization and when the stadium proceed from left to right and when it is fully, fully depolarized, then repolarization starts from this from the other side and goes back to its normal state. So from starting from the normal stage, depolarization by stimulus, and when it is fully depolarized, then the repolarization starts, which goes back to the unstimulated stage to be stimulated again by external stimulus or by self-stimulus, whatever maybe the tissue type is. So this cardiac action potential occurs when the membrane potential suddenly depolarizes and the depolarizes back to its original state. So as I have already discussed that it results from highly controlled sequential changes in ion conductance through gated sarcomelar membrane channels. There are a lot of uh, type of uh, membrane changes. They have got different type of activities, different type of handling of the ions, and thereby they have got characteristic function in the action potential and uh, uh, including, uh, including depolarization and repolarization. So typically, this is cardiac action potential has uh, been defined as five phases. Phase one is depolarization, as you look over here, and most of the sodium and calcium ions work. Well. Phase one is a sodium channels cause. Phase two is a plateau phase. Phase three is the rapid depolarization phase, and uh, phase four is the <clears throat> is the resting phase. So this is to understand that we have five phases, starting from phase zero to phase four. Phase four is the resting. Phase. But there are certain differences between the type of tissue. As you know, that uh, uh, cardiac function is given by two types of, mainly two types of tissues. One is a pacemaker type of cell, and there is a non pacemaker type of cell. There is a only connecting cell. So if you see in the, on the left side, we can see the uh, ACA node. They have got a special cells, and they had, their action potential actually has got three phases. One is phase four, depolarization, depolarization. So that phase four actually. Uh, is what we call it a pacemaker phase, pacemaker action potential because there is continuously development of the uh, 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 action potential there so that they can, they can create the spontaneous uh, uh, impulses can be developed from this. So there are two types of even uh, action potential in two types of cells. On the right side, you can see the different, uh, different type, different uh, tissues and different conducting system has got contribution to the present day understanding of the ECG different waves. So, uh, so these are the position where from these different type, different uh, sets or different uh, uh, part of ECG is being created, we'll discuss in later. So this is how a non pacemaker cell, cell and a pacemaker cells act, uh, do their actions for proper initiation and conduction of cardiac impulses and thereby causing sequential contraction for the maintenance of the circulation. The, another important aspect is the pacing principles of the heart. Uh, pacemaker, as you know, as a pacekeeping force, like who is maintains the peace or means the who dominates the other. The pacemaker actually dictates the rate of other part of the cycle so that the pump can be regularized. It creates organized beating, which can give rise to effective pumping action and set the pace that all the other cells of the heart will follow. Each area of the conducting system, though, has its own inherent rate. The firing of the descending order from the ACA node to the Purkinje fiber. So, so you can see that almost all the tissues has got their spontaneous, spontaneous uh, emulsifying capabilities, but the 
pacemaker, but the tissue which has got the highest pacemaker rate will dominate uh, the uh, dominate the function of the lung as in the arm forces. So these are the different types and the location and that and their spontaneous firing rate. SA node seventy to eighty, AV node forty to sixty, like that, and up to Parkinson's fiber uh, that has got the least firing rate is fifteen to twenty per minute. Now we can compare uh, this how the electrical activities is coupled with the mechanical activity. That the basic mechanism of cart function is the excitation and contraction coupling to manage the cardiac function. This is the mechanism for myocyte contraction. If you can compare in this figure, the typical picture of the ECG on the upper side with different waveform and the first part is in the, you can say part of the atrial systole, atrial diastole, atrial uh, diastole, and you can see over here the ventricular diastole and ventricular systole. If you can now compare with the electrical uh, electrical activities in the form of an ECG and mechanical activities of atria and ventricle on the bottom, you can compare what it is. And one systole, ventricular systole, another systole is uh, is composing of a car one cardiac cycle. So the basic idea we have to understand that electrical activities usually precedes by the by, or the uh, contract activities, and this has been termed technically as excitation and contraction coupling. So now with this physiological and very basic, very basic uh, uh, understanding of uh, of electrophysiology of heart, let us go to the fundamental principles of the electrocardiography. What does it mean? ECG means. The ECG we technically know in this part of the world, but in many part of the world it has been termed as the EKG. So electro actually means energy, cardio means heart, and gram means to write. So this is the surface measurement of millivolts uh, on outside cell, not in the cellular recording, transmitted through body fluids from the heart muscle to the skin, and measures only the electrical activity of the heart. This three principles you must understand. So this is a measurement of electricity. And this is measured from this from the skin, not from the heart or not from the intercellular fluid. And this is this particular uh, uh, test measures only the electrical activity of it, nothing else. But we can have some surrogate parameters when we say left ventricular hypertrophy and other things that are actually the surrogate parameters of the electrical activity of the heart. So now, what does the ECG actually record? That this is actually record the cathode record as I already shown, and this has got two part. One, they record the magnitude of the electrical activity and the direction of the electrical activity. Another important aspect for this electrodes are actually placed in a very specific locations of the surface, surface of the body to detect the uh, electrical activity from the scene. The electrodes are configured to produce leads. Actually, the leads we know is in abstract term, and that is produced by the electrical sensation, by a sensation taking, getting from electrodes, and we uh, define the leads in the later on phase. The outputs of these leads are then amplified, filtered, digitized, stored, displayed to produce an ECG recording or to display ECG recording. So we can see that there are, there are a lot of things before we see an electrocardiograph in our table. To understand uh, electrocardiographic uh, waveform, three basic laws of electrocardiography you must understand. One is, on the right-hand side, you can see, if a positive complex will be recorded if the electricity or depolarization wave moves uh, towards the lead, this is positive form. If the impulse move away from the uh, recording leads, the waveform will be negative. And if it is perpendicular, almost perpendicular, it will be biphasic, means both the sides. So these two, uh, three laws we must understand. So a positive way, a negative way, and a biphasic way. How these uh, different type of uh, uh, ECG format, uh, complex form, differs from different leads. So this is uh, one important I, I, uh, idea to understand the depolarization and sorry, and depolarization and depolarization of lead. You can see in the left hand side, this is P wave is formed from the SN node to the ATL activities. And subsequently, when in the delay in the AV node is there, then this segment is formed. I will discuss it in later. And when this goes to the ventricular contraction, then PQRS is formed. And subsequently, when depolarization occurs, this is the song. So this is, in fact, 
a depolarization and deflation from the left to the right is a, con uh, is a consequence of electrical activities and subsequently by the mechanical activities uh, tethered with it. So these are the leads. What are the leads you need? The term lead does not refer to the electrode. In our, uh, in our setting, many of the hospitals we call the electrode as a lead. No, lead does not refer to the electrodes. Conducting the ECG machine is the heart. That is not a lead. The, those are called electrode. And the development of the uh, development of the pro uh, proper way of uh, writing the complexes is the lead. By looking the electrical potential differences between the uh, placements of the positive and the uh, negative electrodes, the, actually we develop a view, and this particular view is called uh, leads. So we can say it uh, clearly that leads can be considered as different viewpoints of the heart's electrical activity. It means that heart is working in a certain direction with a certain magnitude, and in in which which way on which from where of the from which side of the body we are looking this uh, activities can be recorded we call it them as lead so these are the types of lead actually for a standard 12 lead ecg uh, uh, is a is a general practice and they are the, the point of discussion of today actually there are a lot of other things uh, in 19 sorry uh, in 1984 in over in japan i saw uh, there was a one procedure known as surface electrocardiograph they were used and they use 97 electrodes. Definitely, uh, a computer should. Uh, I, I think that is not still used, uh, not used at, uh, nowadays as a surface ECG. So the practice of 12 bit ECG, we have got 12 bit ECG, and usually they are formed by 10 electrodes placed in the body uh, to create these two 12 uh, conventional ECG. These 12 con conventional ECG are uh, three bipolar leads, bipolar limb leads, one, two, three. And three augmented, they are unipolar leads. They are also limb leads, AVR, AVF, AVF, AVL, AVF, and six precordial leads. See on the right hand side, uh, you can see the chest leads in different way and the vibrant leads. So these 12 leads actually sees the heart uh, from different aspects. So these are how this has been created. I'm not going into detail. You can see the from left and right arm, uh, the lead one is created from here. The heart is been seen from the left side, directly lateral side, left lateral side of the heart, and in, in lead to, the, this is uh, seen from, at least from the, uh, from the uh, uh, below, from below, uh, the ABA two, and lead three also from, BB, uh, uh, from the below side of the heart. So these are the way how this standard bipolar lead has been created. And these are the, uh, these are the type where unipolar, standard uh, unipolar limb leads has been created. And they look from look the heart from three different parts. Uh, AVR from the right arm, left arm from the left side, and AVA from below. So these are the six leads, uh, limb, lead, limb leads, about three uh, bipolar and three unipolar. And these are the way they look to the uh, heart and uh, they observe the uh, formation of the, uh, of the ECG, ECG morphology. And these are the uh, six. Chest leads, these are unipolar leads starting from the wheel and central terminal, and positive is from V1 to V6, and you can see this is the lateral side. So from horizontal uh, plane, these leads will see the heart in different way. So in practice, you can see on the level side, we get to use 10 electrodes placed in the chest and different part of the lower limb side, and these are the morphology of different uh, uh, complex from different leads. So you can see over here, basically they have got different morphology. Say, see your PQRS complex here and see over here, totally different. So the morphology of this uh, uh, QRS complex will definitely differ from different part of the show, part of the, of the lead concern. And they are unique for that, for that position in healthy position. Sometimes we have to place right hand side lead, and this is the way you have to put in the right side chest leads. This is the usual standard way of placing uh, chest leads for, uh, <clears throat> for 12 bill ECG. And you can see over here the same, same picture has been given in a, in a broader way. These are the different type of morphology of, uh, of different leads over here. These are from the uh, frontal pen leads or limb leads, and these are from the chest leads. 
So we have to remember and to try to understand, to have the have general understanding, the morphology of the PRX complex of different leads. What is the normal for that different leads? When it will deviate from the normal, possibly that will give you some abnormal information. So another way is the there are clusters of leads which can face certain part of myocardium, which is very essential for the ischemic heart disease and some, some other diseases. So here you can say limb leads, actually one and AVL are considered an anterolateral. On two, three AVF, we call it inferior. AVR, basically right-sided lead, this has got, it looks to the RV chamber. But chest leads, V2, V1, V2, V1, V2 is anteroceptal, V3, V4 is anteroepical, and V5, V6, anterolateral. So this is another way to remember the which side of the heart is being seen by which group of uh, uh, leads. And that will indicate that any disease process, ischemic or infarction or other uh, of that particular respective work. So now let's come to the ECG graph paper. ECG basically is a graph paper. It has got a different line. And actually, the smallest number is millimeter by millimeter. The millimeter squares are there. And the darker lines actually divides in the five millimeter scale. You can see about five millimeter scale here. here. And time is measured in the horizontal axis, time. And the paper speed, when paper speed is 25, uh, 25, so one millimeter is equal 0 0.4 second. And if it is 0 0.4 second, and if it is uh, five millimeter, you can have to a 0 0.2, uh, 2, 2 seconds. And amplitude actually is placed in a millimeter. So the voltage is uh, by, by millivolt, and sometimes we call it millimeter, and the time by either milliseconds or seconds. And we must be familiarized, uh, familiarized with uh, this particular ECG graph paper, with the speed, what will be the uh, value for the, uh, for the waves. In more detail, uh, this is the measure measurement. This is one millimeter, this is five millimeter. And these are the time for four and five millimeter for two. And like this, uh, these are the time. So two important aspect of ECG paper is you have to find the, the measurements, the millimeter, and secondly, important is the, the speed at which the ECG has been recorded. This is the two, two fundamental things. We must uh, understand the ECG speed, uh, uh, speed, and that will give the value of the, uh, the sc smaller square or the last, larger square. So again, with this uh, typical uh, uh, physiological aspect, let us see uh, very quickly to the different components of the ECG. So we have got, in the standard uh, ECG, we have got waves, we have got intervals and segments. We have got four waves, we have got uh, three intervals, and we have got three segments over here. The inter waves are P, Q, R, S, T, and U, A, and intervals P, R, Q, T, R, uh, and uh, segments are T, P, P, R, and Q, T. Uh, look, the depolarization of the Asian node and AV node are important events, but do not themselves produce any detectable weight normally in the 12 bed ECG. So what we see over here are the mainly the atrial and the ventricular uh, electrophysiological function of the heart has been recorded as ECG. The P web simply, uh, this is usually due to the uh, depolarization of the raped and light atrium and usually is measured from the TP segment to the PR segment. You can see over it, it is a TP segment. The PR segment, this has been measured. There's a P wave. The P wave should be upright, nearly 2, 3, and AVF, and should be smooth and round in shape, like this one. Should be one PF for every Paris complex. So, this is uh, simple to understand. The first wave of the complex is P wave. The second the uh, is wave. Actually, this is a complex of waves. The QRS complex is measured from the ventricular, uh, is a measure of the, represents the uh, ventricular depolarization. And this duration actually is measured uh, from the beginning of the QRR ratio to the J point of the oxygen. And they have got basically, not always, but basically they have got three components. One is Q and R and S. So duration of, duration may be from 0 0.6 second to 0.12 second. And the amplitude usually is varies from 2 millimeter to 15 millimeter. And in most of the cases, these points are very sharp and uh, and are narrow, narrow at then less than two seconds. So this is the picture of uh, 
a key virus complex, which is three component. The key wave, uh, the R wave, uh, I'm not going to detail, but uh, they have got a different morphology in different type and different position and different leads. And their naming is like this. When only uh, a, a negative voice there, we call it key waves like this. When uh, there is only R wave, we can call it R wave. In between, there will be a lot of type of morphologies and maybe some of them will be normal for certain leads, but some of them will be abnormal for other leads. So then the T waves actually, T wave actually puts the ventricular repolarization. It always uh, always follows the QRS completely normal one. And the duration is 0.1 to 0.25 uh, seconds. And the amplitude is less than five millimeter in most of the leads. And normally upright is one, two, and VT to B, VT to V6, and variable in the other leads. So this is this is started from the end of the ST segment to the beginning of the TP segment. So EUF is not always present, but when it present, actually the uh, the actually there is controversy the for the genesis of this particular wave, but they appear uh, in the same direction as the, the T wave, and it probably represents the the polarization of the Purkinje fibers. Important to distinguish from the second P wave because the uh, many a time these are this is the place for the second P wave. So it's very important to distinguish whether this is an U wave or an P wave. So this is like this, this is an actual ECG. You can see the T wave and it follows the E wave, but it is totally different than the P wave of the preceding, uh, of the preceding wave. PR interval is quite important, and this represents the time delay between the atria and the ventricular depolarization, and this includes basically two things. One is P wave and, and the P, uh, P wave and the PR segment, and the total is PR, PR interval. And normal duration is actually 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds, or three to five small boxes in the ECG uh, paper. Huge interval uh, represents the time between the onset of ventricular depolarization and the end of the ventricular depolarization. So it's uh, it measures the two aspects of the ventricular action potential, depolarization and the end polarization, and measures from the beginning of the keyword the RVs, of the keyword complex and the end of the T wave. When the uh, interval is corrected, we call it QTC by certain formula later, we can see that. So this is the way how to measure the uh, T, uh, T wave. Two important aspects we must understand that firstly, the, there may be you should measure the surf angulation of the major part of the uh, T wave where it ends. But when the E wave is a bit of distance and away, apart, away from this particular line, this should be excluded from the measurement of QT interval. But if it is fall, falls on the of the T wave, the U wave falls on the T wave, it should be included in the QT interval. This is a very simple aspect, but, but uh, in, in usual practice, uh, I have seen very less, maybe the electrophysiologist will know it better and they will see quite frequently. The maximum slope intercept method is the used to define the end of the T, T wave as I have discussed here. And then uh, this is a corrected uh, uh, because we know that this QT interval varies from uh, the heart rate, and here is the mainly from the basis formula we use QTC is QT divided by the square, to square root of RR interval. So they maintain measuring two interval uh, by their mathematical calculation, we can get QTC, which has been nowadays automatically calculation by the machine. So then the RR interval is important. It is uh, the starting from the R, one R to the other R, and its measurement from R, R wave peak to R wave peak it represents one cardiac cycle and the duration depends on the rate definitely used to determine the rate and the regularity of the cardiac rhythm in many cases in routine practice. PR segment is a very small segment and represents the uh, time between the end of atrial depolarization and the start of the ventricular depolarization. And it measures from, from the end of the P wave and to the onset of the QRS complex. And, and it is isoelectric flat with a duration of lastly 0.2 to 0.1 second. So this is uh, another part which is iso considered can be isoelectric. Uh, uh, iso the other part is TP segment. The ST segment uh, is uh, again, they represent the period between the completion of the ventricular depolarization, uh, really when they start with the J point to the start of uh, to the ventricular depolar depolarization. It, it is starts from the end of the keyword complex and ends the onset of the tears. 
somebody is talking. That's anyway, uh, the STT complex represents the ventricular repolarization. So this has the two components, which represents basically ventricular repolarization. The TP segment, again, the TP segment actually represents the time between ventricular repolarization and atrial repolarization. Depolarization and it measures from the T wave to the beginning of the P wave. Its duration depends on the rate, obviously. The segment represents electrical resting state, and this is sometimes referred to the baseline or the isoelectric line. Another isoelectric line, sometimes we call it TP, uh, so, uh, sorry, peer, uh, peer, uh, peer segment. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one thing I must uh, ask you to be aware is the confusing ECG terminology. Basically, RR interval is really QRS and QRS interval. This is wrong uh, typing mistake. QRS to QRS interval. And PR interval is really P onset to QRS onset. And QT interval is really QRS onset and T end of the interval. So do not confuse. So there, these are the some of sometimes it seems to be confusing uh, terminology. Not every QRS complex has QR or S wave as I showed you earlier. So these four important things should not confuse you, confuse you uh, when you read the ECG. Uh, possibly we are coming to the near end of this presentation. Let us see how to approach the 12 blade ECG for interpretation. And this is typical. Uh, nowadays, we have got 12 blade ECG print out in a page format, and uh, sometimes with giving rise to some uh, automatic or computerized reading, uh, reading and measurement data. So this is how uh, we have got we have got three, four rows. The first three rows has 12 leads shown in three, uh, each of them three loads. And the last one has, is a single lead, maybe V1 lead to, usually lead to, to identify, uh, easily identify the arrhythmias. So how to approach? These are the few things just to comment, if you have the comment to how we have to report or to have, under, to report or to understand yourself, what are the way to interpret 12 blade ECG. First, we must see the interpret standardization or calibration. And you can see usual calibration is one with voltage at 10 millimeter. We can count them, go for a heart rate, for atrial and ventricular rate. There are different methods. Usually, uh, they have got one of three of the methods being used. Uh, 15th is by the number of moves, current cutoff method, or number method. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, I'm not going to detail. So you have to measure the heart rate. And then you go for the rhythm and conduction, whether there is a sinus rhythm or there is a conduction abnormalities, whether each PO is followed by the QRS complex, et cetera, et cetera. And whether the P morphology is the same, the same leads or different for that particular lead. The, each and every lead has got a specific type of uh, P morphology or QRS morphology. If it deviates from that, we may uh, think something abnormal. And then we go for P wave. Uh, of course, this uh, height, weight, and duration should be there. PR intervals should be there. Uh, you have to count. And the more important is the QRS complex. Here, we usually uh, measure the uh, QRS axis, the electrical activity, basically, see the QRS axis. We see white, and you had where to define the morphology. Because this particular uh, deflection of the ECG resembles the ventricular depolarization where the most of the mass of the uh, heart uh, actually contribute to this uh, uh, formation of QRS complex. So most of the derangement in different disease conditions, starting from ischemic heart disease, hypertrophy, electric, sometimes electrical embolism, ionic changes, actually it is reflected in the QRS complex. So this is really complex. The name is complex, and possibly the uh, is, is assessment is also complex. Then you go for the ST segment. Mostly this is ST seg segment. Deviance is very important. This is very important for ischemic heart, heart disease. And remember, uh, everything should be measured in the J point, uh, J point, and you have to define uh, from where of the J point you are measuring it. And then you go for T wave, QT interval, I have showed it. And if E wave is present, we can uh, uh, define it and see the morphology here. And most of the cases that this particular E wave has been seen or visible in lead, just lead V1 and V3. So this is how reporting has been done. Patient data you have to give, some technical data to give, and then uh, give some detail of the 12 bit ECG. You can give in a short one, step by step. And after all, then you go for a uh, summary of the key findings. One important aspect over here, try to understand what the referral physician has, has asked you any question or not. If he asked any question, 
about the disease pattern and then try to answer that question from a Rishi Ji finding. So this is the one. Now, in the last few slides, uh, computer interpreted ECG, is it beneficial? Uh, yes, beneficial to some extent. Of course, there are certain limitations. Few examples. So this is the example of the con computer uh, imputed ECG. What actually this computer uh, generated interpreted ECG actually gives us? So these, there are certain uh, identifying things over here, and there are some measurements. Uh, starting from some QRS duration, QRS, QTC, et cetera, as I have told. So they give some measurement of the rate, some measurement of the axis, and then they have got certain uh, certain diagnostic uh, uh, diagnostic statements, which may be not done. But these statements, you must carefully interpret. So that's, that is why almost every machine, as you can see over here, they give a, a, the, a stamp over here is, this is an unconfirmed diagnosis by the machine. So what is important is all computer interpreted ECG should also be uh, reviewed by the uh, computer physician. Uh, now, a few examples. See over here, this is, uh, this is a ECG, you can see over here. I think uh, it, 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 it would have been interactive, I could uh, go for a question, but you can see this is ECG. So what the computer actually, uh, as a read it, the computer read it as irregular rhythm, no detected P wave, PBCs with Bysimini. Do you think all these are correct over here? Possibly not. Most of you think that this is not like that. So what is the, those who overread it, the physician who overread it, what he says, he says that this is a normal sinus rhythm, there is no PBCs and the uh, uh, rhythm is regular. So this is, the, what the computer says, what the overread it says. So our analysis is over here is, this is an unrecognized regular sinus rhythm with double counting of the heart rate due to T wave over sensing. So what that is done is actually, he also senses the uh, 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 high T, uh, high T, uh, T wave and the, that heart rate become double. And that's why considering the QTC interval also over sensing for 509 seconds. So note over here, there's a no QT pro prolongation warning appears in the diagnostic report. Though the QT, QT is prolonged, but there is no, uh, no indication that QT is prolonged. So this is what is a uh, uh, computer based, based or interpreted ECG, ECG. But that doesn't mean that every interpretation the computer had generated is totally wrong. No, not yet. But this another one is over here. Look, this particular ECG, and try to have a have a concept. What does it mean? The computer says that this is sinus bradycardia. Rate is 42. I cannot rule rule out anterior infarct. Now, what the overhead physician has said: this is in sinus rhythm. Rate is 84 per minute, and there is two is to one AV conduction delay. So the analysis, our analysis of this is, the computer did not recognize P waves at the end of the preceding T waves and failed to report the two is to one AV block. The last one over here is, you can see this is an ECG, uh, a bit clumsy than previous two. Uh, you can see the computer says, this is a sinus tachycardia with, with <clears throat> premature actual complexes with aberrant conduction, right axis deviation. When it was, uh, given to the interpreter, the overhead, as it is an atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and occasional PVCs. But why it is happens? What it happens? Because the computer misinterpreted the coarse atrial fibrillation waves as P waves and giving rise to that wave. So I think I mean the last part. Let's do some sum up my concluding thoughts. The frontline medical caregivers are often required to make on the spot critical decision based on their ECG readings uh, quite uh, commonly in different hospitals. So computer interpretation of ECG may reduce physician reading time and accurately interpret most of the normal ECGs, for example, calculating uh, duration, calculating heights, amplitude, etc. But the readings are often incomplete and incorrect. So systemic overreading by computer physician uh, should be given so that the computer physician can give is a thing. So it is has been said that systemic overreading 
of the computer interpretation by a competent physician is definitely mandatory for ECG reading. To provide patients with the best standard of care, critical care knowledge in ECG interpretation remains necessary and can only be acquired by continuous education and active ECG training, as has been given by the ECG study group in this particular session. With this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the question. Thank you, sir. Sir, bhai, will you please make a comment? Screen share, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I have to do it. I have to do it. Yes, sir. Atar bhai, would you please make it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have to do it. I have to do it. I have to do it. Distinguished panelists and dear participants, thank you very much for your patient sharing and basic concepts but complex understanding. This is presented in an extraordinary way by our wonderful, by in a wonderful manner by our great teacher, Professor M. Nuzul Islam Sar Sar. Congratulations and thank you very much, sir. This is the not only the basics of 12 lead ECG. This is the basics of our whole schedule, one year schedule. This is the basics also that will be this is as well as basics of our whole one year schedule of our today's ECG study groups program. Actually, our subsequent lecture will be elaboration of this today's lecture. Excellent, wonderful basics lecture, sir. I have learned a lot from this today's lecture. Dear participants, this lecture will be available in ECG study group Facebook Live. You can enjoy the lecture when you need. This will be available in our Facebook Live. Sir, uh, because of the time is short, our second part is Rupik Sar's ECG. We'll discuss if the time is available. We'll discuss if, the, if there are some questions, we'll discuss uh, the questions on this talk afterwards. But before we can start the Rupik Sar's ECG session. Sir, Rupik Sar, I just like to uh, invite you to present your ECG, sir. And if the time permits, then we'll discuss this talk again afterwards, sir. Rupik, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Atar. But I have to just do a little bit of touch up uh, of Nozul Bhai's lecture on the history. Because this today is our first lecture series of the whole session. We'll do it over a year. Um, two things. One, uh, Professor Nozul Islam, um, many years ago, he used to ask me to bring books from America because books were not as easily available. But he was one physician who will not take a book for decoration. He would actually read it. That is amazing. Um, I think uh, reading a textbook, there is no alternate to that. My father was my medical school teacher also. He advised me when I went to medical school, read one textbook. That's number one. And there was another person who gave me one advice. Um, he was one year senior to me, Dr. Nozrul Islam, same name with Professor Islam. He said, Rafiq, Read one book 10 times and you'll know most of it. And that's what I have been doing all my life. And it, I, any subject, I will have a design designated textbook. And when I read the book, I try to read it as many times as possible just to reform my knowledge. So I'm going to, um, I'm sorry that Athar, we're going to deviate a little bit, um, but this is important uh, that we do this. Uh, the history part is, is so important. Um, in anything uh, we, we think. Uh, so uh, this is an old way trusted. Uh, what, this is the guy, uh, Galvani, who actually was obsessed with electricity and human beings. And he first proved that the body he used to take frog legs and connect with the spinal cord. And he, he could prove that it could stimulate and make the muscle twitch. Then what he did, he would take a frog put it on his railing, connect it to the electric wire during thunderstorm. And every time there is lightning, the muscle will twitch. And he proved, well, this is what electricity is doing. Electricity makes our muscles move. That was 17 uh, something. And his name bears the name of the galvanometer that subsequently came. This is the person that Nozurbhai mentioned. What he did, he connected the frog's heart to the leg muscle. And what 
he proved that every time the heart beats, the leg muscle contract. Then he said, look, the heart actually is generating electricity. And that is the first time there is some relation. Um, and this is the galvanometer, early galvanometer that was made to detect electricity. It had no medical use. It was then converted to a capillary galvanometer. It was interesting, it's a horizontal machine. On this side, there is mercury. On this side, there is sulfuric acid. And if there is electricity, this will move and they will take a picture with the camera and that will come up with the tracings. Lipman then changed it to a vertical machine. Again, if you look at it, there is sulfuric acid, there is mercury, and when there is electricity passing, this camera, they will take a camera. This is a microscope, but then they'll connect it to a camera and then take picture of it. And first time that somebody recorded, uh, another I mentioned, Dr. Weller. He's a British person. No, not British. So what he did, he recorded. And what he found that this is not the ECG tracing. This is the apex cardiogram. This side is the mercury, this is sulfuric acid. This is the line where there is this electrical signal. People did not believe him. So he added apex cardiogram in those days and said, look, this signal is moving when the heart is moving, it must be electricity. But nobody believed him in those days. And he would take Jimmy, that picture shown by Nozrubhai and go to give lectures and record this electrical. This is more of a fun thing to do. What, what, why were these people doing these crazy things in these early days of 18th and 19th century? This was total theoretical stuff. In, and theory is very important. In 18th century, 12th century Baghdad, they were very good in maths, but they went for applied math rather than theoretical math. And the civilization declined because they did not innovate. These are not, this is not applied science. This is actually theoretical science, understanding mechanism. And why I'm talking about it, because it is important for our future that we pay attention to theory, theoretical math, theoretical science, and that will give rise to future generation of scientists. Eindhoven, what did he do? He took the same machine, he recorded the signal, but he did something unique. This was the signal that came up. It was very difficult to read it, and they call it ABCD. He then mathematically extrapolated this. The ECG that we see today is not an actual recording. It is a mathematical extrapolation of this signal, electrical signal, and he called it PQRS. Why did he call it PQRS? There is a guy called Descartes in 15th century, 16th century Europe. He used to do mathematical sine waves and his signals were called QR. And Eindhoven took that. The advantage was that Eindhoven said, look, if I take PQRS in the middle of the alphabet, I can add things. And true, after T, we could add U wave. If we could find something else before it, we can start something before that. And that's how it, the PQRS name came. But the current ECG is a mathematical extrapol extrapolation of the actual electrical signal. And then he, Nobody believed Eindhoven, these were heart recording. Then he recorded with the cardio, mechanical cardiogram, hemodynamics, and showed that this is ECG. I'm going to show you some ECG. People always ask me, what is a low heart rate? And this is always a question. Somebody comes with a heart rate of 45, is it bad? 38, is it bad? This is, uh, these are all the animals. This is the biggest animal that we have. Well, 180,000 kilogram, human being 70 kilogram. Look at the hummingbird, only few grams. Look at the ECG. This is the ECG from a blue whale, heart rate of eight. Such a big animal living with a heart rate of eight. So the heart rate by itself is not the important part, is the, how the patient as the subject is doing. When, as a matter of fact, when blue whale dies down, its heart rate drops to four beats per minute. And when it surfaces, it goes to 31. So, that tells you about some physiology uh, of the heartbeat. And I'm, what I, we try to emphasize, what Nozulbai said, that what is the patient needing? What is the patient? How do they record electrogram on whales? They have suction cups uh, connected to the underbelly of the 
it's important science to remember how, how much people pursue science and technology that they put suction cups under the belly of the whales and they can record the signals. Um, hummingbird has very fast heart rate, like um, 204. Um, and, and that's about it. I'm going to go uh, just, just for your uh, fun. I, I thought this would be good fun to talk about this history and the enemy ECG. We're going to do some questions. Uh, today as, as we do. Um, I have to mention something about con computer interpretation that Nozul Bhai mentioned. When I, all our ECGs are read by the computer. Anytime I get an ECG, I do not look at the report. Because what happens, if I look at that report, it biases me. So please have that practice when you have computer generated ECG, please do not look at that report. Have your own interpretation and then compare with the computer report, whether it's uh, accurate or not. So, Ravi, uh, yes. As always, whatever you say, I go against. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my advice, you know, I read about 130, 140 EKGs easily per day. Um, yes. And I, two things I do when I go to the hospital. I take all the EKGs during the morning conference and they read the EKGs and put the abnormal ones aside. I look yes. at the computer read first and then see why the computer is not doing it right. And then I feedback the computer that this was the problem. So there's a, and also the one that abnormal, I actually go to the computer and then tell the residents that what happened what happened to the patient? And that actually gives me more insights about how to approach EKGN. And just, I take this opportunity because it is a fun to disagree with Rafik Bhai. And my goal is, and I tell the audience, my goal is to, 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 to share with you how not to be intimidated by EKG. Because EKG is a, is a situation where residents and fellows get intimidated. And Rofik Bai will enjoy that. I am actually with you so that you don't feel intimidated. <laughs> okay. But uh, so as usual, I have to disagree with Hafiz. Hafiz, don't go. Stay on the screen. The, the problem is when somebody like Hafiz looks at a computer report, he has the courage to say no to it. But most of us, or average, everybody looking at the report will say, well, I don't know much ECG, maybe the computer is correct. And in the learning phase, it biases us. Once you reach the level of Hafiz, I read about 200 ECG in an hour. Am I reading them? No, what I do, I scan them, my memory, I just look at it, I throw it to one side, look at it, throw it to one side because my memory, then I stop at certain ECG. So I think it's a combination, I, I, I think, it, but, but the whole, what Hafiz is mentioning is important that you, you develop this symbiotic relationship with the computer. And, uh, and as you know that in American Board of Cardiology exam, we have uh, two sections. One is unread ECG and the other part is a computer generated ECG that you have to analyze and make sure it's correct or wrong. And anyway, Hafiz, thanks for having, uh, it's good to have Hafiz, otherwise life is not fun. Okay, we'll, we'll go with the ECGs. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's put up some polls. So should we start the poll? Yeah, give 10 seconds and then let's start the poll. Okay, sir. Review poll, Dio. Yes, sir. Sir, will we be giving 20 seconds for them to answer? 30. 30, okay, sir. 30 seconds for the participants to answer. Would like to, as many of you, as you can answer. Remember that um, 
we, we have been talking about it. Uh, nobody knows who is answering what, but it gives us some idea. And uh, if you um, correct, if you answer correctly, you feel good. If you don't answer correctly, that's fine also because then you, we can we can uh, correct ourselves. Despite the fact that my answer, my spelling was wrong, uh, majority said um, correctly, right? Um, what do you want to comment on this, please? Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, the heart rate is given below, heart rate 45. And the twist to one FE block, we have to find out if there is more P waves than the Q waves complex. It's not there, particularly if you look at the rhythm strip. So that's out. Then the bradycardio with first degree FE block, the PI interval is quite within uh, the limit. So it's also out. The last is sinus bradycardia with long QT interval. When the QT interval is uh, more than 50% of the RR interval, you can surely say uh, at this rate, there is obviously QT prolonged, but it's not. So the re re result is sinus bradycardia, otherwise normal ECG. Uh, thank you. Well, sir, I mean, sir, one Nepali doctor raised hand. Dr. Ruhi, okay. yes, from Nepal. Can you hear Dr. Rohit? Possibly. Uh... Sir, he lowered his hand. Yeah. It was by mistake. So we'll, we'll, we'll call him. No, he must be mistaken. Yeah. Call it. No, sir, he wrote it, it was by mistake. Can you connect with Rohit? Sir, can you connect with Rohit? Sir? So, I mean, why did I put these choices? Just to have us analyze, but one of the thing is the sinus rhythm with two to one heart block. Anytime I see a low heartbeat, I want to make sure that I'm not missing another P wave. And if there is another P wave, if we look at this, look at my cursor here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven big boxes. So I should have seen another P wave over here if there was anything, and there is nothing. Sometimes, as you remember that nodule by showed a picture that the computer reported it as a sinus bradycardia because it missed the P wave here, which probably thought it was a U wave. So, but majority answered correctly, uh, and we are happy with that. Thank you. Sir, one question, sir. Yeah. Sir, in V1, yeah. sir, yes. in V1, the morphologies of the P waves in the first bit and the second bit are not same. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a little, I think it's probably, you know, the P wave is so small. If I magnified it, you will see there is a positive and a negative component. If you look at lead V2, it's same. So there's a subtle difference. Also, there is another thing that we forget that the sinus node is a one inch structure. And it can vary, the origin of the signal can vary a little bit from bit to bit. And that sometimes gives minor difference in P-wave morphology. But the overall, if you look at lead one, it's upright. Um, need AVL is upright, AVL is negative. So it's a sinus P-wave. And, and uh, thank you for noting that. But there is a tiny negative component in, in, in lead V1. Sir, sir can I? Yeah. Sure. Sir? Okay. Yes. So there is a question in the chat box about J point. So what is the J point? In this ECG, in lead two and AVF, can you sir please explain the J point? What? The J point will be where the, in this, what is the funny noise? Okay. So the J point is the junction of, uh, between the QRS. Sometimes it's very tough to measure, but as you said, there is a, there is a tiny positive component. It makes it very difficult. So. Is, is the junction uh, of between the QRS and that, but it's more easily visible in V1 and V2 because it's a sharp complex. It, if it gets slutty, then it becomes more difficult. Firoz, I question to answer this is the question. I have to answer this. 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 এবং আমাদের কেন এলাও করা যায় যে আমরা উত্তর দিতে পারি হ্যাঁ তাহলে ওই লোডটা কমে যায় স্যার স্যার এনি প্যাসিভ এনি ইয়েস আর ক্যান অ্যানসার দ্য কোশ্চেন 
Rohit bhai, it is our emergency room. We will definitely STEMI activation. Khai tam. The emergency room wants to try to dispose the patient somewhere quickly. The easiest way is to easiest way to do is to call the intervention cardiologist. But it depends on who is there. Um, uh, if they, if they, if somebody who gives hard time, they don't call them. If it is easy person, they will always call them. Okay, so that's, um, I think this is an excellent uh, group. Um, and uh, I think this is actually Wadu's specialty. Right, <laughs> Wadu loves ECG. Uh, this patient uh, ECG shows, again, there is bradycardia. The heart rate is given around 33. But we start from looking at lead one, there is no P wave. Look at lead two, no P wave. Look at V1, no P wave. So that's going to be the Q wave complex are rather narrow, not that bigger. So this is likely to be junctional bradycardia. And what else is there? The T waves are much too prominent. They are much bigger than the corresponding R wave, and they're very sharp. And if we got the relationship between this a uh, high peak, tall peak T waves and the bradycardia, the answer is very likely the hyperkalemia induced junctional bradycardia. And this is a very important ECG to recognize. The other day, actually, my wife was reading ECG and she sent me similar ECG. And then she called the emergency room, look, this is possible hyperkalemia. Sure enough, patient had potassium of eight, they will give calcium glucose. So that's, that can actually make, save or kill the patient in the, if we don't recognize this ECG. This patient has an ECG or uh, potassium of 7.6. And uh, so uh, this is young Sharbadi cardia. The question is, is it what happens? And nobody knows. Sometimes it is possible there is a P wave. It just don't show up because the conduction slows down so much that the P wave actually becomes almost flat. And you can see that transition when the potassium keeps coming back up, you'll keep seeing that sinus bradycardia with wide uh, P wave. So, so I have a comment, sir. Yep. Yes. Sir, previous but, is it? Sir, sir, in lead V1, V2, and V3, there is a small deflection before the QRS. Can it be P wave, sir? Yeah, well, it's, it's possible. I mean, I did not make the device. A lot of times I would make, if you see here. Sir, before, sir, uh, previous company. This one? This before, one? No, uh, sir, the, the complex, sir, the. Oh. This is the V2. V2 sir, uh, QRS complex, that is uh, uh, deflection before the QRS complex. Previous, previous complex, sir. That's before the that's 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 oh, that's oh, this that's one. That's yeah, I mean, this is actually um, possible, but the problem is, uh, it's tough to say. I, I never comment on a single complex because I have to have a few more complexes. Like if you look at here, there is nothing. So, it's not a repetitive. And then again, if I look at the rhythm step below, um, let me just move it. A rhythm step below, uh, I don't see, but uh, it is possible there is a P wave with a white QRS, but it's not present in, in consistently. So, I mean, it's well noted, I actually saw that. Yeah, thank you. Ravik Bhai, I a comment, ECG, Actor is a board, board is a board. Yeah. 
which is i think is a kind of a game hafiz bhai there are many nepali students oh, oh sorry 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 so uh, uh, i think the uh, reading an ekg for the board purposes is kind of a game it's like a driving test but in real life i would request that whenever you read the ekg please keep in mind who is the patient if this patient is dialysis patient or coming with lethargy fatigue then think about that that don't jump then look at the clinical context why because sometimes clinical context may give you a clue think globally yeah so i think i think that's why the communication with the patient let's say if i am reading the ecg and the patient is in the emergency room it's my job to call the emergency room and let them know and ask i mean it's also out of curiosity look at the uh don't just talk to them and follow up on this but that will enforce your knowledge also that if you know that the person i read an ecg which i thought hyperkalemia and then i found out the potassium was 8 it tells me look i'm doing the right thing thanks happy so this is again the potassium when becomes the same patient potassium becomes 5.5 um and you can see the p wave now coming up here uh, with qrs complex much narrower than before okay sir all your patients uh, are very old elderly 76 <laughs> well, 81 now, no 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 now my young patient is like 75 <laughs> hey, one day i was seeing patient i said oh i found a young patient she was 83 rest of them were like 89 90 95 but they they are in good shape but if you look at bangladesh same thing is happening now um i mean Uh, when we were in medical school how many older patients did we see because i don't think in in my medical school I mean, if you are 60 year old you are not entitled to go to the hospital you are supposed to die but now it's totally changed they call it protoplasm if the protoplasm is good everything is possible if the protoplasm <laughs> is bad nothing is possible Okay oh, so okay. this is a this is a, a big Problem. spectrum So we have from sinus arrhythmia atrial fibrillation majority say that atrial fibrillation um premature and a few say uh, the So now we can invite Zamil sir Yes please But we have because we have all the answers here we have to satisfy everybody why they are correct or wrong urun maski uh, can i tell sir yes, yes sir sure. uh, first uh, the number one is sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia uh, it is unlikely here as uh, we can see that uh, in the lead two in the last but uh, the upper one in the two panel uh, the pr intervals are variable and the prevalence is uh, prolongs uh, gradually uh, then it's not atrial fibrillation number 2 as because there is discernible few edge sinus rhythm is junctional premature beat uh, but um, uh, there is uh, not much compensatory gap and uh, it follows the pattern uh, this um, irregular bit uh, to me it's a one kebek phenomenon uh, sinus rhythm with one kebek with gradual prolongation and followed by a, a drop bit okay so i will do a favor to everybody physicians who answer sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia uh, they have a point because they saw group beating so we have slow heartbeat faster heartbeat slow heartbeat faster heartbeat slow heartbeat faster heartbeat so if i take that 1 2 3 4 5 
four sequence of fast heartbeat. That means if it is sinus arrhythmia, the patient's respiration rate is four, uh, is basically 40. That's a very fast uh, um, respiration rate. So, so that, that, was a, that was unfair, but what goes against is that you can see P wave and that, so when you look at group beating, sinus arrhythmia is one cause. The other group beating is Wenke by block. So please remember, these are the two common group beatings that we find. And in this case, uh, I'm going to come back to that. Second choice is atrial fibrillation with controlled ventricular response. Sure enough, it can be because you can say, well, this is longer, this is irregular, little shorter, shorter, but it is of course, but there is a pattern to it. And the most important, there is a P wave. There are P waves. So that goes. Sinus rhythm with junction of premature beat would have been a possibility. But if I follow the sinus wave, I can see a P wave here. Similar interval, there is another P wave. One can always say there is a premature. The timing is same. Yeah. So the last answer is sinus rhythm, which Wanke by Jamil mentioned. If we, I don't have the grid here, but it's a PR interval. It gets longer. PR longer here because it is coming in. And this P wave, even though we cannot see it, is buried in the T wave and it blocks. And then it starts again. So everybody had a reason to answer the way they did answer, actually. So I give credit to everybody, but the answer is sinus rhythm with one cap every block. Thank you. Anybody else? Any comment? Any faculty? Arun Maski. Arun Maski, please. Yeah, I mean, that's true, because if you see here, there's a P wave, and it's a gradual, QRS complex is narrow. There's gradually prolongation of uh, PR interval with drop beat. So no question of uh, any other answer except uh, sinus rhythm with uh, Winkevac AV block. If you look at this uh, lead V5, that clears everything. So long lead uh, rhythm is very important to see P waves, narrow QRS complex, QRS prolongation and drop beats, which Thank was you. rightly said. The group all. Yeah, the poll is there. Okay. So, all right. Uh, Sinus rhythm, uh, majority said sinus rhythm, uh, sinus bradic idea, first degree AV block, right bundle, left anterior fascicular block. And then we have the other answers. 17% um, said uh, sinus rhythm, two to one heart. Who will do this? Hafiz? Adha? No, Hafiz? Dr. Yeah. Hafiz? So if you look at the lead two, that's probably the best rhythm lead that. This PQRST you can define, and I don't see any, uh, there is a relationship that uh, PR interval a little longer. So we take uh, 
200 milliseconds, and then the right bundle and left axis. So if you wanted to say two to one, you'll have to see that there is a two to one pattern in the P wave, but I don't see that. Um, some will call it trifascicular block, uh, but I, I try not to do that. But basically block is the delay, not, not actually block. Nothing is uh, uh, a block in the conduction. It's just a delay and there is a pattern. Uh, and I would probably say that this is sinus bradycardia, first degree block, right bundle, left axis deviation. Anybody else? No, Dr. Harvey, what, what about the B1? What about B1? Because B1, this is the problem, right? Because in the B1, that first one looks like this. I don't know, this is immediate, but in the, in the uh, rhythm lead, I don't see that. So that's why I committed to lead one, uh, number one, because I don't see a good similar P wave coming repeatedly, but yes. And I just answered to one of the attendees saying that what about this small thing that we see sometimes? And I always, I told him that I always face that problem also, yeah. uh, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, so I'll comment on this. I mean, this is, as I said, anytime I see right bundle, left hand, low heart, I always try to look for a second P wave. Um, if you look at here in P1, this part is exactly the same as this one. Yes. Over here, yeah. it's a little bit buried here. And if you go back here also in lead B3, you see this part. And the timing is exactly one, two, three big boxes. If I go this way, one, two, three big boxes. So this was actually a two to one hard block with the right bundle blank block, left hand fascicular block. Always remember that all these answers are correct. Complete hard block is totally wrong, but all of them are correct. And anything is acceptable. Question is what is the most space? Sinus rhythm with two to one hard block with right bundle, but we are missing out the left hand fascicular block. Let me see if I have another ECG on this patient or not. Uh, no, I don't have another one, but this is two to one hard work patient ended up with a pacemaker. Uh, and once you put the pacemaker in, um, you, you can see, but this second P wave is always, is very is easy to miss uh, the second P wave. I don't know, Ravik, by the, the clinical context, if the patient comes in with dizziness, syncope, one important message, this is most likely in Prahisian. You cannot leave this patient in the after evening for pacemaker uh, tomorrow, because this may be a catastrophe. So yes. we'll be so a... we, we actually had a patient like this. Hafiz, you are absolutely right, that the patient came in with this kind of rhythm. And on day three, developed our sudden VF, because it was persistently bradycardic. And then patient probably received some anti anti antibiotic and developed herself. So, um, so uh, and also the clinical context is very, very important. What are the presentation? I did not write down the history of this patient. Uh, um, I'm sure a lot of time they will present with syncope. Other thing they present with is exertional shortness of breath. What, what, lot of, I have patients, a lot of patients <clears throat> to one heart block. They say, Dr. Ahmed, until two weeks ago, I was perfectly all right. But now every time go, I, I go up the stairs, or go uphill, I get short of breath. So the clinical context is very, very important. Thank you. So then uh, this one actually, um, yeah, we, we will see this one and I don't, this is not fair ECG for question, uh, but uh, I'm going to leave this. Uh, what, what happens is that if I look, I'm going to discuss this. If I look suddenly at this ECG, it looks like, Sinus bradycardia with first degree P block or maybe two to one heart block. Because you see, there is a P wave here. But if I look very carefully, look at the PR interval. Here is about 440 milliseconds, but over here it is longer. And then I did the timing. So I'm not going to do question on this one. I did the timing. The RR interval is 1600 milliseconds. And then I put Every other P wave, if you look at the 1600, 1600, but look at it is changing now. The relationship is changing, 1640, 1650, 
the P to P interval, but the RR interval is independent. So it is, it is such a close relationship. And then I added uh, the second P wave. You can see the second P wave here, over here, over here, over here, over here. And you see the notch here, if we, and here I can't see anything. So this was it. And the other thing that happens, if you look at the P to P interval is 780 millisecond. Look at, sorry, um, 780 millisecond, but the, this P to P interval is a little longer. And we call that ventricular phasic sinus arrhythmia. So uh, I'm not going to put it to, for question. Uh, this one. I think we're going to stop with this one. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. The previous EKG, the how you look at and how I look at. I usually look at the, this is profound bradycardia, and the <laughs> ventricular mechanism is it you know, narrow or ventricular mechanism is it wide? And yes. then I look for the relationship with the P because... Yes. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing about my ECGs are that all the ECG that I give to you all that I have actually proven the diagnosis. I will not, I will rarely give ECG where I have not proven it because then it's not fair because I have to talk confidently about this ECG. Sometimes I'll bring ECGs where I don't know. I mean, it happens. Uh, that I have not proven a diagnosis. So when I will give you hyperkalemia ECG, I will actually give you ECGs where I know the potassium level. And yes. you don't yeah. see it, but I write it down in Japanese so that nobody right. can read it. Right. right. And, and importantly, Ravik Bhai, the patient safety is important so that Ooh, we have a know? differential. We have a differential diagnosis. Yeah. I think in, in oh, this concept of differential is very important, has been very Yes, I think that's the whole point. Emphasize. There may be some other thing. Sorry, Rafiks are also saying, always think of alternative diagnosis. That may be correct. The other point that Hafiz mentioned, that, that you see, it, it doesn't see. matter what the diagnosis is. We can't leave the patient just like that. We have to take it seriously because you don't want a disaster in the middle of the night. So if somebody needs something to be done, I always say, look, do it by seven, eight o'clock uh, because the intervention cardiologist is still not very tired. You don't want to do things in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I, I sympathize with half his intervention cardiologist because EP, we don't have to go in the middle of the night. You know? So, um, okay. Um, shall I do this just, or anybody wants to take volunteer? This. Actually, Dr. Haruno Rashid, can you hear yeah. us? Possibly is not connected. Is it tachycardia or is it bradycardia? Is it tachycardia or is bradycardia? <laughs> White complex or narrow complex? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, the rate is slow. I always write down the rate 42. And the question is, is it sinus bradycardia with left, left bundle bind block? Uh, yes, it's a relation? possibility. It is a possibility because there is a P wave followed by QRS. There is a P wave followed by QRS. There is a P wave followed by QRS. But look at this, there is no P wave before that. Yeah. And other thing, this PR. Wait, lead, lead two is better. Lead two is better. Yes. To follow okay. the P wave. This PR is changing. Changing. So and now I need a caliper. But here, this without a caliper looks to be regular, but then this is early. So what's happening? I put that I put the calipers and then I measured it actually. The RR interval is 15, 20 millisecond, except this one. It is early and preceded by a P wave. And then it goes back to 15, 20, exactly 15, 20. And the P to P interval um, there's a little bit of variation here, but most of them are 800, 840. So there is no relation here between the P and the QRS complex. So the, over here is complete hard block. This is conducted. And 
then again goes into control. And this is the scenario of why it's a very stupid diagnosis we call high grade heavy block, but actually basically intermittent complete heart block, basically this, this is a better diagnosis. Uh, then a high grade AV block will be if somebody conducts three to one or four to one, um, we, we use that, right? Oh, yeah. What do you agree with that? It's a, it's a vague term. Yeah, I think um, I, don't, sure. uh, I have to, uh, I have to disagree with Hafiz again, so I have to give this a C. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, I'm bringing this ECG again and again. This is the ECG actually is miss, most missed. It is easy to miss this ECG. And um, if somebody misses this, you can't blame them because it, it's, it's tricky if you don't. So Ravik, in cardiology, imagination is the most dangerous thing. When you give clean cut pictures, images are good, no imagination. This one is better than the last one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, imagination is not a bad thing. And that's why uh, when you see a beautiful girl, just a flicker of the girl, she looks the most beautiful because you just, you leave it to your imagination. Uh, or other way, or a, a, or a young man who is somebody sees just a little bit, a young lady sees that young man never saw again, looks more beautiful. So, all right, so have we got the poll? Yep. So again, um, I'm going to do this and finish, or happy that you want to do this? No, no, no. Okay, again, it's obvious. Look at the yes. answer. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hafiz is agreeing with me. So, the diagnosis, correct answer. Again, look at this. Okay. So, the whole point is somebody with a heart rate of 46. And I'm going to start with this bottom rhythm strip P wave, QRS, PR interval is normal, PQRS, PQRS, PQRS. And then this patient has a right bundle bunch block, left anterior fascicular block. Anytime I see a ECG like this, I always question myself, is there a second P wave? So let's do this. From here, I'm going to measure to this P wave. One, two, three, four, five, six box, and two. And so I'm going to go to three box. Do I see anything? One, two, three, a little bit. I see something, which may be a U wave or a second P wave. And if it is second P wave, let's go back up. We can see it everywhere. This is lead two, but lead V1, I can see something, which looks like the terminal part of the P wave. Hey, so this one. This is actually even Hafiz cannot disagree with me on this one. <laughs> but so, my point is, eight, a patient, we also need to be worried about infra and block in this patient, right? Yes, yes. Because at least I would worry because I would not leave this patient after five o'clock without a temporary wear if he's coming with dizziness or syncope. Yeah, this patient actually came with exertional shortness of breath. I, I wrote down the same, ejection fraction was normal. So what happened is that he was fine and a couple of weeks ago became more short of breath with normal activity. So he didn't come with syncope. Uh, if this patient comes in the morning, we definitely will do the pacemaker same day. Yes. Uh, um, if uh, it is late, uh, we uh, no, uh, but with a meticulous history, no history of dizziness or pre-syncope, I may leave the patient overnight and do, uh, do the pacemaker tomorrow. But if there often is any in the doubt, elderly, yes. Often in the elderly, they will come with aortic stenosis and please get an echo before you do the pacemaker. Yes, look at this. We already, as, as Hafiz mentioned, patient already got an echo. Um, that, that's important because we always get echo before we put pacemakers in because we, we need to know the LV function. 
And if there is any doubt, before I put a pacemaker in, um, we'll do other workup. Like, is there any ischemia workup needed? Does the patient need a cardiac cath? Um, yeah. We'll get those done with the temporary pacemaker in place. I think we're going to stop here and thank you all for, um, and welcome back to the sessions. Um, we will do this again throughout the year. So I have a few EKGs for the faculty next week. Okay, good. Okay. Thanks. It's really nice coming back again after such a long time and seeing all these uh, favorite faces again. And again, listening to the to and fro academic exchange between Rafik Sar and Hafiz Bhai, it's really a pleasure. And Nodu Sar, you have done a wonderful thing. I don't know how you can do that. You make a apparently simple subjects a, so much academic. That's a wonderful thing to watch and learn from you. Actually, it, uh, I learned it all of, from all of you who are here. And the lecture will be available in our Facebook Live, dear participants. Uh, sir, any comments from Mohsin? <laughs> Today I have just uh, found one patient like this last ECG. Patient was having 72 years and RBB 2 is 2 on block presented with uh, shortness of breath uh, five days back and one physician gave him the that is unique content that is theophylline and today's patient present with sinus theorem, that is the only RBB. What will be the management? Echo is normal. <laughs> 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 so, if you share, share this thesis in the uh, subsequent session. <laughs> yeah. but no, because I, I'll make a comment. This is not very uncommon. I mean, we have patients with right bundle, no documented heart block, comes with exertional shortness of breath, and I put them on treadmill, and you will find that they will go into two to one heart block. That's one. But if this patient has ever documented two to one heart block with underlying bundle bind block, you are basically no choice than to put a pacemaker in this patient because this patient is going to go into heart block again. And a lot of times people will say, well, patient was on beta blocker um, and can this cause heart block? It is unlikely because um, beta blocker to cause heart block, before they cause heart block, they will cause so much sinus bradycardia um, that you will see marked sinus bradycardia. So your patient probably will end up needing a pacemaker. I told him that you need a pacemaker. He told me I will, I am not feeling bad, good now, so I will take time. <laughs> Urun Maski, congratulations, Urun Maski. Oh, thank you. Urun Maski, nice to... nearly 40 students from Nepal, Urun Maski. Thank you. So any yeah, only, the only uh, issue is uh, here the people, students sleep early by 10, 10, 30. So after 10, 30, you will not find many people will be living. So that's a problem everybody is saying. So otherwise, uh, Naujan sir is an excellent teacher. He was my teacher. And Drafik sir, as usual, is a very good lecture. And these lectures are very popular. Only I don't know how to manage time before. If we can manage time, finish a little bit early. Sure. We need to so think about it. That would be it. a great idea for all of us. Okay, Urun Maski, thank you very much for your proposal. What is why? Conclude, 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 conclude. But before conclusion, concluding talk from Vadud Choudhury, our next session, next Sunday, 9.30 p.m., the speaker is, the first speaker is Professor Abdul Vadud Choudhury, Art of Interpretation of ECG, and the second talk will be Dr. Choudhury Hafiz. So, Next Sunday, uh, dear participants, please. Next Sunday, 9 30 p.m., and then concluding lecture uh, talk from the Wadu Chudri. What is I have already mentioned, uh, Atar Bhai, we have really enjoyed the session, and I hope this enjoyment will continue throughout the year and with uh, more attendees and more young participants coming forward and engaging with interesting ECGs. They should send it to the us and we will show them, uh, including the clinical scenario with which those ECGs were presented. So that will be 
an exchange between the very junior doctors and faculties like you uh, that will be very helpful uh, for everyone and again thank you our faculties thank you professor natul sir rafiq sir hafiz bhai and everyone else and also vexim ko pharma you are always with us rifu you are doing a wonderful job thank you Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, thank you, Dr. Rezwan Arima, Gobinda Paul, Ani Sawal, and Mukhadasus and Sadi. Because of shortage of time, we cannot comment from you. And Sophie also. Gobinda, today your shot is simple. <laughs> My shot is not good. a matter of comment. Comment is the same. Lecture, wonderful lecture. Uh, we have learned a lot, uh, both of our two mentors, our direct teacher, Rupik sir and Nozrul sir. Wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody.